The Idris Shah Foundation presents Neglected Aspects of Sufi Study Beginning to Begin by Idris Shah First published 1977 Published in this edition 2017 Narrated by David Alt Idris Shah Neglected Aspects of Sufi Study based on lectures at the New School for Social Research, New York, and the University of California, San Francisco, in association with the Institute for the Study of Human Knowledge, Stanford, California, May 1976, on the nature of Sufi study. The role of systematization, interpretation of poetry, scholarship as distinct from knowledge, disturbance caused by outwardness, polishing the mirror, the apparent as a bridge to the real, the consistency of inconsistency, cults as barriers to wisdom, disabling effects of emotion, testing the tested, what kind of experience, using current methods of research, the role of assumptions, historical instance of scholars arraigning a Sufi heresy, the difference between studying about Sufism and in Sufism, how Sufis can be understood in the West, the immature self, three methods of study, teaching stories, why does a joke wear out, a reality without a name or a name without a reality, Eastern ideas in Western settings, fragmentation of teachings, Experience, qualities and capacity, extra normal experiences, dilution of method, the primary tasks, the use of exercises, music, dance, song, costume, names, mutual recognition of Sufis, ritualistic practice, extra dimensional cognition, a framework for new knowledge, the completed human being. Reason for so many Sufi schools. The secret preserves itself. Seeing and knowing. Conditioning, anxiety, impatience. What the teacher should make clear. Pitfalls in study. The emergence of the learning function. How everything fits into its place. You may have forgotten the way, but those who came before did not forget you. Saying of Master Bahudin Naqshband of Bukhara. On the Nature of Sufi Knowledge In a collection of the quatrains of Omar ibn Ibrahim al Kayam, we find this poem Chun Hazil i Adami da in Shuristan, Jus Kurdan i Gusa Nist, Yakadan i Jan, Kuram dil i Anki zin Jahan zud biraft, Asuda Kasi Kikhud Niyamad Bajahan. Since the lot of humankind in this bitter land is nothing but suffering and sadness, happy the heart of whoever quickly leaves the world, tranquil the person who did not come at all. But since we are all here, and haven't now the option of not coming at all, we deal with it as it is. I cannot, and I am sure that you would not want me to, use what is usually termed a systematic approach at this juncture. This is, of course, because Sufism is always systematized only for limited or transitory periods, because Sufism is primarily instrumental, not for enjoyment or display. But its study, especially in poetry, can be hard. In Kayam's quatrain, the first line refers to the problems of study, hard if we take it on that level. Annoyance and disappointment come during the studies, as in the second line. The third line refers to the happiness of rapid or temporary leaving the world, sometimes found in ecstatic experiences, but it is not permanent. The last line speaks of whoever did not come at all, as the state of whoever is not burdened by the considerations which prevent his perception of objectivity, of the untrammeled knowledge of the original, or, in another formulation, of the realized or returned man or woman, returned to the essential state of knowledge or objective truth. 
So if you have been through certain stages of learning, you can discern, underlying the poetry, the humour and the emotional aspects, the pattern of the stages through which people pass in their Sufi journey or process. Approaching the materials analytically requires the right kind of analysis. Were it otherwise than that Sufi development is experience, you would be able to get all your knowledge from books, as with other subjects of human study where exemplars, demonstrators, practitioners and living teachers are not needed. There would be very little need for live lectures, and people could read papers or hear talks through recordings or the printed word alone. This is not to say that Sufi knowledge does not take advantage of books, though on a lower level. Since we live in a highly literate and literary culture, books and even transmissions of knowledge can be useful, providing only that one knows how to use them. Because, I suppose, of a yearning for personal contact, people have often leapt upon my saying that knowledge comes from a person and not from a book, demanding teachings and refusing books. This has been reinforced through the well-known habit of selective reading by quotations from Rumi, such as in the Divani Shams e Tabriz, when he says, of the man of God, Mad i Khuda nist faki az kitab. The man of God is not a scholar from a book. The would-be students wish to transcend books. But ask yourselves, if someone says that books do not contain wisdom, and yet he writes books, books do not contain Sufism, and yet he continues to publish books on Sufism, what is really happening? It really is your duty, and not mine, to ask and to find the answer to that question if you are interested enough. But since we are here and it has come up, let us answer it to illustrate the way of thinking which is so important to us. First of all, hear Sheikh Saadi, where he writes in the second chapter of the Gulistan, the Rose Garden, Batil ast an ki muda ai guyad, kufta ra kufta kai kunad beda, mad bayad ki garad anda gush, va nevisht pand badiwa. Eastwick translates this as Futile is the objector's scorning, sleepers ope not slumber's eye. Heed then well the words of warning, though on a wall thou them descry. This may sound like poetry, but if we translate it for content, more literally and less rhythmically, we get in English it is vain what the accuser may say. When can the sleeper awaken the sleeper? Humanity must get it into the ear, even if it is written wisdom on a wall. The two conceptions do not conflict. They do if we are dealing with literal thinkers who imagine that they are studying a form of, say, physics, where everything must always be the same. What they forget constitutes two of the most significant items in Sufi study. 1. Circumstances alter cases. Advice given at one time may not apply at another or for another person. 2. The poem tells us that certain things must be heard even if they are written down. The poet does not say, and do you not imagine that he was capable of saying it, what Eastwick imagines. He does not say, tell people things even if they are not listening. Neither does he say, wherever you get this information it is important. It actually says that whatever form it appears in, it must get into another form when being absorbed. It does not say, for instance, even if you are asleep you must hear it, or even if it is on a wall you must see it. The first two lines are not necessarily intended to explain the second two unless you are working on the low level which was the height of Eastwick's capacity, or perhaps the height of what he thought his readers could take. The unlocking of the meaning of a poem comes through contemplation, not enjoyment, in this kind of instance. And this is not a criticism of enjoyment, merely of incomplete working with the material. So, with written materials, things written down can provoke thought, can increase focus in directions where perceptions can operate on a higher level. 
It may be written on the wall. It must get into the ear. These are analogies which mean they come in through one perception, they are assimilated by another. They may be presented in more than one way or locution. Much Sufi literature is analogical or provocative. It is intended to cause you to do or feel something. That something is not confined to like or dislike, to hope or fear, to cudgeling your brains, to discussing with your friends. These customary ways of dealing with almost anything merely mask the developmental, the educational content. And before one gets to that point, things which have been read leave a trace. This trace, not necessarily consciously registered by the sleeper, will be digested into another area when adequate experiences are operating. At this point, and people very often say, this is terribly difficult, or this is not what I came for. The answer, of course, is that this is the difficulty characteristic of Sufi study, just as the difficulty characteristic of Zen study might be to imagine a clap with one hand, or with certain forms of monastic discipline, to flagellate oneself. Before you think that something is too difficult, ask yourself whether other things are any easier. The nature of Sufi knowledge is that it has an outward shape, constantly reformulated to make it more accessible and to maintain contact with the culture in which it operates, and it has an inward meaning, which it is the task of the school and the teacher to bring to the student, with both parties exercising maximum effort, maximum relevant effort. Remember, one man's relevance is another man's nonsense. Most people work only on the outside. It is neater, but does it help? In the London Times the other day, it was recorded that a semi-official British organisation, the British Council, a cultural body, has been baffling its pensionaries with instructions printed on their sealed payment envelopes. The notice reads, Important. If the envelope contains money, check the amount before opening. Claims for shortage will not be considered if the staple or flap have been disturbed. I am all for flaps not being disturbed, but what about people being disturbed by externalist thinking like this? Those of us who are engaged in the matter of Sufism often feel that people trying to approach the subject want, however unwittingly, to divine the contents from the outside, what some call the lowest level. They want the contents without opening the container, want, that is, to understand the subject without entering enough into it. So I must reaffirm, following with apologies for any unfashionability but without any personal reluctance, the admonition of the Sufis for centuries, that Sufism is studied by Sufis and by Sufi methods. Anything short of this is sure to provide a more or less simplified picture subject to limitations of understanding, unless at the same time the door is kept open for a further range of understanding. The removal, transformation or outmanoeuvring of those misunderstandings about Sufism which are so prevalent today among cultists and even some of the conventionally learned, as they have always been prevalent, this dealing with the underbrush remains one of the most important tasks of the Sufi. You will realize how important when I say that Sufis such as Ibn Arabi, the greatest sheikh, insisted that Sufi knowledge was adequately represented as enabling people to understand the knowledge which they already had by polishing the mirror of their minds. This means that it is as adequately represented in this manner as in the other way of referring to it as the developing faculties. Sufism is experiential. Capacities, even those for learning beyond a certain point, are provoked by Sufis, by one's own efforts and what results from them, and by an element of what is referred to by Sufis as the divine. Sufism is experience, and hence not to be defined, imprisoned in perennial static categories. Sufis never tire of saying this. Because most ordinary thinkers those accustomed to conventionalized thought do not study Sufism and also take this contention into account, they generally ignore it. 
In so doing, of course, they provide the hilarious sight of people who purport to explain Sufism, often to intermesh it with various religious, mystical or occult systems, sometimes all three, in books, articles, lectures, but do it violence by including in their rendition of Sufism only such arguments and other materials as enable them to work in this way. What has happened here is rather as if a knitter of string shopping bags has unpicked a carpet and taken the hessian, sackcloth, warp or woof and made a bag out of it. It may be useful in this form for the transportation of groceries and other things, but it should not now be called a carpet or what a carpet should really look like. You can buy books by such people at almost any bookstore in the Western world these days. Some writers in the East also produce them, and certain publishers in the East publish some of them. All of this leads to much confusion. But there are other people than these. First, there are those, not so few in numbers as some observers imagine, who can and do follow the Sufi thread through materials issuing from authentic Sufi origins and activities. Since such people are not in need of lectures on what Sufism is and is not, we are not talking about them just now. There are others, too, who may or may not have a potentiality to understand things beyond the relatively narrow range now occupied by civilised and cultured man. They often ask, if virtually all Sufism is experience, and if all Sufi experience is in some way at least unique, how can we study much less understand, such a phenomenon. We do so in exactly the same way as we do other subjects, when we have to introduce a relatively false concept, an approximation, to lead to a truer one. Following the maxim, al-majazu kantarat al-hakika, the apparent is the bridge to the real. As a rough approximation, we can compare the invariable approach to Sufic study with how we start from the known to the unknown in conveying, say, roundness. We say, the full moon is round, so is a penny, so too is a saucer or plate. All these statements are relatively true, though they may all be said to be relatively false. But perhaps roundness is ultimately conveyed either by this method or by including this method in our attempts to establish it in the mind of the learner. Naturally, according to the experience and other characteristics of the learner, we use different analogies, cake, sun, circle, not forgetting that we must maintain the knowledge of the fact expressed by the proverb, every round thing is not a cake. The barriers to Sufi knowledge, at least initially, are mainly mistaken postures on the part of the student. The very human desire for consistency, reassurance, certainty, whether these things are useful at any given time, or even if they are positively contraindicated factors at various junctures, causes people, whether approaching Sufism or many other things, to seek, almost to crave, single, definite, very often oversimplified formulae, not as instruments or vehicles of learning, but as truths. This is the sole reason why temporary teaching formulations, equivalent to cakes are round, are adopted as holy writ or infallible truths. What has happened is that the individual, whose need for mental stabilization may be stronger than his desire for truth, attaches himself to so-called principles not originally intended to be such. Everyone is familiar with examples of this, even if he or she has not yet identified it in operation within our own Sufi interest. In many cases, this tendency leads to a cult, sometimes literally so, sometimes in a concealed way. As soon as we see the operation of this factor, we have to realise that the individual or group manifesting it is blocked, not seeking Sufi knowledge, but equilibrated on a perhaps useful but effectively different activity. An example of this behaviour is the worship of the fact. Such and such a thing is true under these circumstances, 
therefore it must always be true. Truth is truth and indivisible. With modern science, including physics, discovering rather unequivocally the relative nature of even the most enduring seeming facts, Sufi thought has a great attraction nowadays, and a chance to explain itself a little better. Nowadays, it appears to many people far less improbable or magical. A quantity and variety of people can now approach it who, in earlier years, would not have been able to do so because of its inconsistencies. In the more specific sense of a cult, of course, Sufi studies have often deteriorated into the automatic and mimetic use of robes, beards, formulae and appurtenances. These exterior objects and concepts have a powerful appeal for those who need reassurance or who desire something strange, but their use without an understanding of any function which they might have or might have had, and the transitory nature of formulation designed to protect and conduct from one stage to another, leads to idolatry, the grasping and holding on to things which hamper progress because they are static. This is not a Sufi way at all, but a social phenomenon. At best we have a new tribe, at worst a coercive either-or instrument. Saadi refers to this when he says, in Persian, Batazbi o Saja o Dalknist, the path is not in observance, the rosary, the prayer rug and the robe, the stan one. This is, of course, what Shabistari, A.D. 1317, means when he says in The Secret Garden, which is much quoted in Sufi circles, If the Muslim knew what the idol was, he would know that there is religion in idol worship. If the polytheist were informed on religion, how could he stray in his faith? He sees in the idol only the outward and created. For that, he is legally a heathen. The above passages inevitably have been taken by the various self-styled experts on Sufism to prove that the Sufis are against religion, or that they are soft on idolaters and so on, and that Sufi knowledge is therefore sophistry. I hope that I do not have to take it that my present audience needs any further interpretation of what these lines mean, viewed from the real Sufi standpoint. <laughs>